And so Benny explains, he's like, well, the quote is out of context. The transfer was inevitable because of the Arab warring against the Israeli population. And he would go, but you said here, the transfer of Arabs was inevitable. <laughs> I'm like, no shot. I'm trying to be, for the first couple hours, I'm trying to be incredibly respectful, incredibly humble, because obviously there's three people here that I think that I'm, I'm definitely the least knowledgeable, I would say. I've spent the least amount of time, for sure. So I'm trying to be chill or whatever. And then after the after the two hours are done, Lex is like, yeah, maybe you should you should be a little bit more aggressive. Don't let him ramble. And then Benny was like, yeah, you need to cut him off more. You, you do like internet debate, right? This is what you do. And I'm like, okay, I mean, okay, if you want me to. And then the next two hours were unhinged. Rate your debate performance out of 10. Um, uh, also, we're, I'm gonna be doing more Israel-Palestinian debates over the next month, okay? I have to, I did, I did so much research. And we didn't do a single, there wasn't a single thing of substance that got discussed in the six hour debate. Six hours of no progress. Oh my fucking God. Holy shit. What a horrible ordeal. Oh my God. Oh, I missed the Ayla gangbang for this debate. Christ. Did he do the quote thing? Bro, so the first, so the first part of the debate, we were supposed to spend, I think like, probably 20 minutes talking about like, Zionism and, and transfer in the Nakba. That conversation took two hours, okay? It was a two hour conversation and we got nowhere. This is, I, I think the uh, Muin uh, Rabani guy, I think he probably, you could have furthered a conversation, although he had his own issues. But <laughs> first of all, so Norm brings three books, okay? <laughs> They're all his own fucking books. <laughs> They're all his own books. To quote Benny Morris out of, because why would you quote him out of his own book when you could use your book that where you quote him? Why would you quote him out of his actual writing when you could just quote your quotation of him, okay? Which is already fucking hilarious. So I feel like, Half the debate is, so we're arguing over whether or not transfer was built into Zionism, right? Did Zionism require transfer of all the Arab Palestinians, um, initially in the mandatory Palestine area, or in the Levant, and whatever the fuck you wanna call it. So I think we all go around the table a little bit. I think Benny explains his stuff, I explain whatever. And then Norm goes, Mr. Morris, I've, you wrote here, and he flips through his fucking book where he's got his bookmarks. And I swear to God, I'm gonna say this, Morris, you wrote here that Kaisman said, the transfer of the Arab population was inevitable. And then he does this thing where every time he reads a quote, he sits back and he does this. for about five or 10 minutes. Every time he reads a quote, he like he's Plato and he's just enlightened. And so Benny explains, he's like, well, the quote is out of context. The transfer was inevitable because of the Arab warring against the Israeli population. And he would go, but you said here, the transfer of Arabs was inevitable. <laughs> I'm like, no shot is this the whole conversation. It can't possibly be this bad. It cannot possibly be this stupid that you would quote the guy who wrote the book and give a, and give, and give a, like a 10 word quote, a 10 word quote. And then Benny tries to explain, oh my God. I think we spent about two hours on that. About two hours on that. And 
I'm trying to be, for the first couple hours, I'm trying to be incredibly respectful, incredibly humble, because obviously there's three people here that I think that I'm, I'm definitely the least knowledgeable, I would say. I've spent the least amount of time, for sure. So I'm trying to be chill or whatever. And then after the after the two hours are done, um, so ben, ben, Benny starts talking to me. Those two leave. They go out of the room for a smoke or a drink or cover or And Benny's like, I don't think this makes for very good TV. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I guess. And he's like, I just don't know what the point is. They're like, well, I don't... I don't want to like interrupt him a ton, but yeah, this seems like pretty dumb. I don't know why we're fighting over like two quotes of yours. Um, Rabi, uh, Rabani tried to bring up like, well, Theodore Herzl wrote this in his diary, and um, and Benny Morris was like, yeah, that was like one sentence out of like a forty-page diary. He didn't talk about transfer much. It just wasn't a big thing that they spoke about. Um, and then Lex is like, yeah, maybe you should you should be a little bit more aggressive. Don't let him ramble. And then Benny was like, yeah, you need to cut him off more. You you do like internet debate, right? This is what you do. And I'm like, okay, I mean, okay, if you want me to. And then the next two hours were unhinged. Um, so I, Norm must have called me a motor mouth, or he's like, Norm is like, I, when I say words, they matter to me. And I'm like, I know, you've said that three times. If they matter to you so much, why do you keep saying the same words over and over again? And then he's like, uh, God, it was horrible. At one point, he's like, Sir, don't impugn my uh, academia because you read Wikipedia. I read the original sources. I'm like, Norm, you don't speak Hebrew. You can't read the original sources. Why would you even say that? God, what a horrible conversation. It was actually horrible. Oh, and he does this thing. It is the best debate strategy I've ever seen. I might copy this debate strategy, okay? Norm does this thing. When he doesn't want to talk to you anymore, okay? He does this. He goes, he goes, sir, ex sir, sir, excuse me, sir, excuse me, sir. Sir, um, and anyway, sir, blah, blah, blah. And then he'll stop. He does this, like, he, like he's Darth Vader. Like he's casting like a spell on you. He puts his hand out and then he just does this and then he just keeps talking. <laughs> like, what a horrible conversation. Oh my God. I don't think he responded. He, anytime I would bring up a point or a quote to counter anything he said, he would say he doesn't want to talk to me because I'm a motor mouth who talks too fast and reads Wikipedia. And then he would redirect to Benny. And then Benny would say, well, no, Stephen's right. And then he would restate what I would say. And then Finkelstein would read a quote. And then do this stupid smug smile and sink back in his chair and like stare at the wall of the ceiling. And I'm like, Re the um, Muin Rabani was more reasonable, but then even his arguments were ridiculous. I tried to bring up in the beginning, I was like, hey, um, like you, you, Norm, I, Norm says he's a stickler for the facts, but the facts are, uh, in the beginning, you, you say that the Jews wanted transfer and the, the Jews were exclusionary, but it was the Arabs that shot down literally every single proposal. And Wayne was like, well, yeah, but if Israel accepted them, it's not like they would have actually accepted them. And I was like, the initial UN partition plan of 47 had like, it was like 500,000 Jews and 400,000 Arabs living in the same territory. Are you saying that they would have expelled all of the Arabs after accepting the partition plan? And Wayne goes, well, yeah, they were just brown people. It's not like Europeans care anyway. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck am I, how am I even, what am I even supposed to say to that? What What a wild fucking point. You're gonna expel half a million people because they're brown? And then later on, I think like four hours later, Wayne was like, I saw on stream, you said that apartheid or that Jim Crow wouldn't have qualified as apartheid, which was shocking to me. And I was like, well, I don't know if it would have. Apartheid refers to like a pretty particular set of like, you know, top down, lawful, whatever racism. And he's like, and he's like, well, that's shocking to me. And then I asked him, I was like, I'm sorry, do you think that I support Jim Crow laws? And then he wouldn't answer that question. He wouldn't say, he wouldn't answer it. I'm like, wait, do you, do you think I'm supportive of Jim Crow? Bro, oh my God. What a, it was a horrible conversation. I didn't know it was possible to sit for, uh, Matt Pearl, thanks for 20 gifted subs. It was, I think we had, it was either five or six hours of a conversation. Did you ask him what his definition of concentration camp conditions are? I, we got to that, but any time I challenged him on anything, he is the ultimate appeal to authority. Where he'll say, well, all the, these human rights organizations say this or that, or this or that. Um, and, then I, um, and then I would bring up something to counter it, and he would just ignore me. He just, he, but every, anytime I bring up a quote to counter him, he would just talk to Benny. He'd be like, I don't want to talk to you, Mr. Wikipedia. Like, I've read through that ICJ case, which, oh my God. Bro, the happiest reason to get away from all the Israeli bullshit is the Israel shit will blackpill you on every fucking thing in the world. That ICJ case is so unbelievably fucking retarded. Holy shit. Um, 
So he would bring up that, so he brings up like, well, actually we like, we know a guy that went through every single quotation in that South Africa case and all of them are gold. It's like, I went through like, I think I brought two or three with me because I had so many quotes. I didn't even think I would get out any of these or I didn't know if I'd get out half of these. <laughs> Little did I know I wouldn't get out a single one. Um, that the South Africa ICJ case like misquotes so much stuff. It's actually like criminally fucking stupid. Um, yeah, oh my God. It was just, it was horrible. <laughs> it was, it was a horrible conversation. Are the last hours gonna be funny content? Like yes and no, there's gonna be funny content, but it was like five or six hours and the funny moments, I think it's mostly gonna be boring, but who knows, <laughs> my God. I think that, um, uh, what was I, I don't even know. What a horrible conversation. Oh, I think, I, now I wonder if Norm does run his Twitter account, Jesus. Do you think it's gonna do better numbers than you, your debate with Shapiro? No, because the Shapiro debate, we actually had a discussion, even if it was, not very contentious. This one, I don't know. Do you think Fingelstein will get away from it, optically speaking? Well, yeah, because people that support him are gonna support him. They're gonna say that it was epic and base that he didn't respond to a single point of mine because he didn't have to justify himself to like a YouTuber. They'll say something like that, yeah. Sounds like the moderation wasn't great. Um, Lex did his best, he tried. But like, there were times where like, there were times where Rabani was trying to get Norm to be quiet because he was trying to get a point out. And then there were times where Norm would like tell Rabani to be quiet and he was just like going on and on. It was just like insane. Do you think it's gonna be obvious to the audience how inept Norm is? Um, I would hope so, but I truly don't know. I, he doesn't bring up, like the thing is, Norm doesn't establish or bring up any good point ever. So for instance, oh, there was another part where Norm says, if I can quote you, this was one of the most disgusting books you've ever written. Benny Morris, you wrote here that Israel tried to minimize casualties in Lebanon. It brings up his other book. Allow me to read this. And then he reads the diary entry of some soldier in Beirut or something who was talking about how they, you know, a lot of civilians were dying. And then he puts it down and I'm like, what, I don't understand what the point you just made even was. Like what, what was the point of what you, what was the point of this? I think probably the worst looking moment. So he'd avoided debating you for months and when you finally sat down and refused to engage with you, that's crazy. True. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was just there. It almost felt like he was trying to farm TikTok clips on Benny Morris. <clears throat> what is Finkelstein's academic background? Non-existent. <laughs> he had one good thing in the 1980s, I think, when he did a, um, his PhD challenged a book, and I don't even know at this point if it was a good response or not, where he challenged a book on some lady and it's funny because everything he accuses her of doing in her book is basically what he does now in all of his writing, which is selectively misquote things out of context, uh, selectively cherry pick sources, and then, yeah, Jesus. Um, so you did read my Reddit post, which one? Did you have with Benny afterwards? Uh, yeah, we talked for a little bit. He was a funny dude. It was funny to chat with him. <sighs> um, God, these guys are just insane. I think probably the worst part, the most, the cra and I call this out, and Finkelstein gets mad every time he's called out. Because um, Finkelstein was like, many people, so first, they're like, many people died on October 7th. That was horrible. And then I was like, wait a second. When you say many people died, do you mean, do you think that most of them were killed by Hamas or the IDF? And Finkelstein was like, it was a tragedy and many people were killed by Hamas. And I was like, hold on. When you say it was a tragedy and many people, do you think that like more or less than half were killed by Hamas? And then Finkelstein was like, well, I'm not sure. And then Muin tries to save him and he's like, well, hold on. Well, Hamas wasn't the only one there. It was also Islamic Jihad and blah, blah, blah. And then Benny is like, okay, well, obviously he means like Palestinians. And then I'm like, well, yeah, but I don't want to say Palestinians because then they're going to accuse me of being racist when I know it was like Hamas and the other blah, blah, blah. They try to dance around that point a few times. And then by the end of this like chain of like trying to figure out, like, do you think the IDF killed all the fucking civilians? And I answer the fucking question. Neither of them would commit to a position of more than 50% <laughs> where they were like, I think that because um, finally the Muin guy was like, probably most of them were killed by 
Hamas and Islamic Jihad. And I was like, when you say most, do you think like 51% or 99%? And then he's like, a clear majority. And I'm like, so like 60, 70, 80%? He's like, well, over half. <laughs> I'm like, why is it so hard to land on, a, on an approximation here? You truly have no idea? You think about trying to be respectful since you were in a room with three giants on the topic, you held back and you're authentic of debating, blah, blah, blah. Um, no, I mean, it was the last four hours were a shit show. The first two hours, I was a little bit quiet, but um, yeah, I don't know. It was just stupid. It was just, it was retarded. It was a horrible conversation. Were there any parts of the debate where you think you could have been uh, done better or been more researched on? I think I was adequately researched on everything. Um, the only thing I didn't, um, it would have been more rhetorical strength. Or I don't even know. I don't know if I don't know if there's any way. I don't know how to beat the force hand thing. I don't know how to beat this. I don't know what the counter is for that. <laughs> Did you watch Noah Samson's vid on you yet? Yeah, I watched some of it, but it's also dumb. Um, I need to do like a. I have all these little like mental mind models for how people work. And I think I need to put these together in some coherent way. There's like a, there's this thing that happens where, and it's very frustrating to deal with. Okay, you have some like, you've got some belief and then this belief becomes like, be, like out of this belief, you might say something like this, okay? Uh, I'll just, I'll use the extra thing, okay. So your belief is, um, we'll say like innocent people should be alive, right? Don't kill innocent people. That might be your belief. So your belief, uh, you know, translates in policy to murder is wrong, you know? And this like, this position becomes synonymous with this position. Or I, I might even say like killing is wrong. Right, where, where these two things become synonymous with each other, which isn't like necessarily the worst thing in the world because they're pretty closely tied, right? So your belief about innocent preservation of life to killing is wrong, but the problem is we run on something called a, a euphemistic treadmill where it's not just killing, it's murder. It's not just murder, it's mass murder. It's not just mass murder, it's war crimes. It's not just war crimes, it's genocide. And you end up in this weird world here, and Noah Sampson does this all the time in his video, where Genocide is now, genocide is this thing, okay? So your belief is that protecting innocent life is important and so we need to prevent genocide. And when anybody argues against the idea of a genocide occurring, in your mind, you're like thinking that like, so you think killing innocent people is okay? That's the direct connection. And it's the dumbest, most thought terminating and it happens with all of these words, with all of these words in this section, to where, um, you know, I don't know if what's happening, I don't know if Palestinians getting, you know, kicked off of something, I don't know if this was counted, like, is this like an ethnic cleansing, or if this is like the worst, and it's like, oh, so you think every single, you think all innocent people are allowed to be expelled from their lands because they don't fit the racial democrat? No, what the f I didn't say that. Or I just, I don't know if this particular thing would count as ethnic cleansing. I don't know if it's, oh, so you're okay with all of them being kicked off forcefully and never being, no, I didn't, no, I didn't say that. I'm just not sure if it would be this thing. I think people getting kicked out of their homes is tragic and horrible and we should avoid it as much. Or, you know, I don't think, the Gaza Strip is not a concentration camp. Oh, so you think those living conditions are perfect? You don't think those people have any problems? You think they should stay like it forever? No, I didn't say that. I think it's tragic. I think there's a lot of issues. I think there's a lot of um, stuff related to food security, insecurity, or you know, water issues, the electricity. Oh, so then it is a concentration camp. No, it's not a concentration camp. Oh, so you think it's fine? No, what the f are you talking about? Every single one of these stupid f buzzwords gets used like this, and it's so stupid. Uh, like, you think it's okay that the people in the West Bank are held to different courts? Uh, no, I don't think so at all. So it's apartheid. Well, no, I don't think, it would, I'm not sure it's apartheid, especially not in Israel proper. So you think it's okay that Palestinians are treated? I said, no, I don't think that's okay. I think that obviously we need to resolve so then it's apart. No, it's not apartheid. Like this happens with every word. With genocide too. It's so stupid and thought terminating. Kill me. Did Finkelstein really pretend not to know you? I don't know. 
in the beginning of the conversation, like, what is your name? And I'm like, Stephen Bonnell, you call me Mr. Bonnell, you call me Stephen, whatever. Because he wanted to call Morris, Professor Morris. And he was like, I don't like using first names. I was like, okay. I think like five times in the first couple hours, he's like, Mr. Burrell, Mr. Borelli, Mr. Bernal, Mr. Burnell. I think he calls me like three or four or five different names. After our first break, he gets up to do something. I don't know what it was. Oh, they were getting up to get coffee or something. I don't remember why, but he asked me a question. Or he looked at me and asked something. And he looked at me and I was like, Mr. Bunnell. And then I think like me and Benny looked at each other. I'm like, wait, what the f***? So wait, so he does know my name. Wait, what? What just happened? How did he perfectly? I don't know, bro. My God. I didn't have time to go through, um, I didn't have time to go through every single quote for the ICJ thing. I read the full um, South Africa submission and then I read um, the two concurrent judge opinions. I didn't get to read the oral arguments, but even on the few quotes that I looked up, bro, this South Africa case is fucking wild. The way that they quote and misquote and selectively edit things is actually insane. Um, Can somebody link me the South Africa thing real quick? It, it is so, it is so fucking blackpilling to see how this, uh, to uh, Jesus. The funniest thing is the most important part of genocide is the special intent part of which they spend like, I think the least amount of time on, but okay. Okay. Expressions of genocidal intent against the Palestinian people by Israeli state officials and others. Evidence of Israeli state officials specific intent. Also, I never want to call people out on having read stuff or not, but I brought up this phrase, this dola specialis, and neither of them were aware of it, but they both told me that they'd read the ICJ stuff like 15 times, or like three or four times. So they read and reread it, but they never heard this phrase before, which is pretty important when it comes to genocide, right? Because this is the, this is the thing that makes it genocide. You can literally, I think I said, I think I even said something like, you could destroy, you could nuke all of the Gaza Strip and it still wouldn't be genocide. And I think, Moeen, I couldn't hear, but I think you said, and I bet you'd like that. <laughs> I'm like, bro, what? Why are you so, why are you so unhinged? Evidence of Israeli state officials' specific intent to commit and persist in committing genocidal acts or to fail to prevent them has been significant and overt since October of 2023. Those statements of intent, when combined with the level of killing, maiming, displacement, and destruction on the ground, together with the siege, evidence on evidence an unfolding and continuing genocide. They include statements by the following individuals in the positions of the highest responsibility. This is the first one they list, by the way. Okay, I'm not cherry picking, all right? This is the very first one they list, all right? Prime Minister of Israel, uh, on October 7th, oh, wait, 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 hold on, wait. This is the first one, but this is the one I'm talking about. <clears throat> this, this first one isn't even anything. In a televised address by the government press office, Pre uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu promised to operate forcefully everywhere. On the 13th of October, 2023, he confirmed that we are striking our enemies with unprecedented might. On October 15th, when Israeli airstrikes had already killed over 2,670 Palestinians, the Prime Minister stated that Israeli soldiers understand the scope of the mission and stand ready to defeat the bloodthirsty monsters who have risen against Israel to destroy us. Like, none of this even, pr but okay. Um, it was the second one. I'm sorry, the second one, not the first one, the second one. <clears throat> President of Israel, on October 12, 2023, President Isaac Herzog made clear, made clear that Israel was not distinguishing between militants and civilians in Gaza. This is probably one of the most incredulous breaking of international humanitarian law that you could ever do. Um, I think the principle of distinction might literally be the very first rule listed on the... Um, um, it might be the very first rule listed on the, it is, it is literally rule one, okay? If you were to say that you are no longer distinguishing between civilians and combatants, that's a really big deal, okay? So, stating in a press conference to foreign media in relations to Palestinians in Gaza, over one million of whom are children. Man, we love the children here. Holy shit, we bring this up over and over again. Quote, it's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true, this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. And we will fight until we break their backbone. That's a pretty 
to be fair, that is a pretty extreme statement. Okay. It kind of looks like it could be genocidal, all right? What is the actual article that they that they put in their own? Keep in mind, hold on. I'm not like finding these. Okay, I'm not like going out of my way to look for any crazy stuff, okay? This is what their own submission links to to source that quote, okay? So the title is, Israeli President Isaac Herzog says Gazans could have risen up to fight evil Hamas. President Isaac Herzog is Israel's head of state. He spoke on Wednesday about what he called the largest single massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. But when asked about the bombardment of Gaza and the humanitarian situation of civilians, his sadness turns to anger. I asked him what Israel can do to alleviate the impact on the over 2 million civilians in Gaza, many of whom have nothing to do with Hamas. We are working, operating militarily in terms according to rules of international law, period, unequivocally. So we already have a wild separation from made clear that Israel was not distinguishing between militants and civilians in Gaza. So we are, we're already wildly departing from the opening s sentence here. But, okay, maybe he says something else later on. It is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. It's absolutely not true. They could have risen up. They could have fought against that evil regime, which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. Oh, okay. So he's not necessarily saying that they... that. The civilians aren't innocent and aren't involved because they were like part of the terrorist attacks. He's saying they could have coup d'etat. Now, is it a smart statement or a dumb statement? Maybe, maybe not. But significantly different than implying that all of them were like the people attacking on October 7th. But okay. And then right after that, uh, right after, it's not true about this rhetoric about civilians. Okay. We will fight until we break their backbone. That was, was that talking about all the civilians? There's a whole other sentence in here that they're omitting. Okay. But we are at war. We are defending our homes. We are protecting our homes. That's the truth. And when a nation protects its home, it fights, and we will fight until we break their backbone. He acknowledged that many Gazans had nothing to do with Hamas, but was adamant that others did. I agree that there are many innocent Palestinians who don't agree with this, but if you have your missile in your goddamn kitchen and you want to shoot it at me, am I allowed to defend myself? We have to defend ourselves, and we have the right to do so. To, to pretend that this one quote is capturing even the spirit of like what's being said here is unbelievable. I don't know how, and there are, there's, which other ones did I go over? I think I only pulled three out of this because I didn't have time to go over every single one. Um, On October 2023, uh, echoing the words of Prime Minister Netanyahu, the president told foreign media that we will uproot evil so that there will be good for the entire region and the world. The Israel president uh, is one of many Israelis to have handwritten messages on bombs to be dropped on Gaza. Okay. That ellipsy is fucking insane. It is. They really lean heavily into this human animals thing, but apparently in Hebrew, there's like a word or there's a, an expression, uh, shayat adam or whatever. I don't fucking know. Um, it's not like, it wasn't supposed to be like an untermensch fucking <laughs> statement, but um, let's see. Bazel schmock, smock, 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 smock. Where's this guy? On October 8, 2023, Bezalel Smotrich stated, stated at a meeting of the Israeli cabinet that we need to deal a blow that hasn't been seen in 50 years and take down Gaza. Okay, sure, that's a pretty out there quote, yeah. When we say take down Gaza, the powerful finance minister Settler leader uh, Bezalel Smotrick, 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 I don't know, demanded at the cabinet meeting late Saturday that the army hit Hamas brutally and not take the matter of the captives into significant consideration. In war, as in war, you have to be brutal, he was quoted as saying. We need to deal a blow that hasn't been seen in 50 years and take down Gaza. He's taught, it's literally a direct reference to Hamas. 
I remember bringing this up, and they were like, I think they both said like, oh, well, of course, when you say Gaza, though, you mean all of Gaza. And I, and I think my counter was like, so when Ukraine says that they need to defeat Russia, are they saying they want to kill every Russian civilian? And then I think Muin laughed, and then I think Finkel Dick did his like, staring off into space with like the dementia smirk. Oh my God. Why do you think the ICJ is continuing with the case then? I, I don't know, bro. I'm, I don't know. I don't even wanna. I don't even know, bro. Holy shit. There's just like, Israel is like the number one nexus of unhinged takes. I didn't get to bring up any of the, uh, another thing that Finkeldick, if you, again, if you open that inquest into martyrdom book, basically every single thing you will find is going to be, is, is basically, I would say, if you want to become the most informed person on recent Gazan history, Gaza-Israeli history, buy Finkelstein's book, An Inquest into Martyrdom, and fact check every single quote. Because basically every single thing he says in there is either a deliberate lie or a misrepresentation to the point of falsehood. Um, something that was brought up to me, this is, I think I did this research off stream. Finkelstein believes that, um, he, Finkelstein believes that the Iron Dome is fake. He thinks that it doesn't do anything. He thinks it doesn't work. I think we were reading about this on stream a little bit. Um, I did some digging around for this. I got linked to a few articles that I read. So all of these claims come from, he, they come from a guy called Theodore Postel. And it's funny because remember how when we were looking on stream, when Finkeldick was talking about, um, well, when I look at people, I always try to see if they're biased in one direction or another. I always try to see if they're biased, you know, blah, blah, blah. So apparently, Postal and the other guy that publishes research with him are one, uh, advocating for other methods besides the Iron Dome, which is a huge conflict of interest, by the way, <laughs> number one. And number two, the guy's research is probably faked and it's bullshit. The guy relies on YouTube videos to try to ascertain like whether or not Iron Dome interceptions are happening. And the guy plagiarizes his research. So for instance, I won't read through this entire Bellingcat article, which is like 10 years old, by the way. One of the most concerning parts of the coverage is the fact that none of the journalists took the time to check the photos used by Postal in particular to verify their accuracy and if they actually depict what he says they do. The author was able to identify four instances of manipulation of photos by Professor Postal, manipulations that cast a serious doubt on the ethical nature of his work, and also raised the possibility that perhaps he has manipulated other data in his published work. In his memo published by the Anti-Iron Dome and Pro-Thel, so it's Tactical High Energy Laser, also known as Skyguard or Nautilus Group, uh, Megan Laworth, translated as Homefront Shield, Poster writes that one of the photographs contains an image depicting the damage from a Qasim rocket. So here's the image. I think the one on the right might be the one that he uses for a study, and the one on the left is what the is what it actually comes from, is where the image actually comes from. The original source for this image is a 2007 presentation on Hezbollah's rockets in the 2006 war on the left by Uzi Rubin, the same man who has defended Iron Dome from Postal et al. The photograph is titled Impact of a 220 millimeter Anti-Personnel Rocket. Even if the qualitative differences between the two projectiles are minimal, it is strange and unethical, unethical for Postal to take a photograph from somebody else, change the aspect ratio, and then caption the image differently without acknowledging the original source at all. Further in the memo, Postal has a grainy photo with the following descriptive text. The next photograph shows another example of a rocket casing that has been bent by glancing blows from Iron Dome warhead fragments. One can see on the front end of the rocket bent back sheets of rocket mo uh, motor casing indicating that the warhead exploded. And then he uses this photograph over here, like a part of it. This is what's in the study, but this is what the photograph actually comes from over here. The photo first appears in a Times of Israel article with a larger version of the same photo where it is written that an Israeli police sapper carries a Qasem rocket that landed in an open field near the Israel-Gaza border on December of 2011. The IDF only intercepts rockets projected to impact in urban areas. An open field near the Israel-Gaza border is not an urban area. In addition to Postal's altered annotation, the original image is copyrighted by um, Safrir Abiyav Flash 90, yet Mr. Abiyav is not credited in the memo. The last and most troubling instance of improperly used photos in the memo is in regards to the following photo, which has been in existence since 2009, at least two years before the Iron Dome was deployed. 
Postal's annotation of this image states that the photo shows an example of a rocket carcass that was hit by a fragment near the top of the rocket motor casing. This indicates that there was a fusing error that led to a failure to place fragments on the rocket's warhead. This photo predates Iron Dome deployment by at least two years. It would be impossible for the Iron Dome to be involved in any way. Lastly, while perhaps a relatively minor detail, this copyrighted photo of Mr. Abayab was again not credited. <laughs> what the f the memo is indubitably the product of Professor Postal as the font used and the stylistic practices in the documents are identical to other documents known to be from the man. There are striking similarities in writing as well. The memo hosted by Megan Laoref is not the only Iron Dome related work from which Postal misuses images. In an article for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Postal includes an image with the accompanying text, a view of damage apparently caused by the detonation of a warhead of this rocket when it hit the ground. The original source of this image was an article by Ynet News, where the caption reads, the shrapnel that hit the Tel Aviv synagogue. Um, and then you can see here the difference between, so on the right, this was the photo that ends up in his bulletin. Again, he always crops things to make them look as extreme as possible. And then on the left, you can see that it's like, just like a thing laying on the ground with the stuff around it, not necessarily looking as like completely even if the Iron Dome failed to intercept this rocket, there was one known failure in the Tel Aviv metro area. Flights were even canceled after a rocket landing near the international airport. It is unclear why Postal would claim that there was a detonation of a warhead. There is no impact crater shown, and if the warhead actually did explode on the ground, wouldn't the 100-pound-plus warhead have created much more destruction? Postal doubles down on this assertion in figure 4A, where he uses a blown-up version of his edited image and writes, Holes in an empty rocket motor casing suggest that an Iron Dome interceptor warhead exploded too late to detonate the target rocket warhead in the air if, as Postal said, the warhead detonated when it hit the ground and that the Tamir indeed failed, why isn't there a crater? Postal told Reuters that there would have been an impact crater for nearly every rocket. Does he believe that there is a conspiracy by the Israeli media to cover up any damage in Israel? Here are three additional photos of the same scene, progressively further away from the impact location, which help identify the synagogue as well as the precise position in Tel Aviv. So here's where you saw the thing landed. Clearly, it's not an exploding fucking rocket. Oh, yeah, here's his blown up image on the left here again. Yeah. But anyway, so this is a guy that, um, this is a guy that uh, Twinklestein cites to show that. I just want to read the quote out of his book, so I'm not misquoting him. Does Finkelstein think Hamas just isn't firing any rockets? Yes. Finkelstein thinks that people for the Iron Dome, he thinks that the Iron Dome is propaganda and that Israel makes up the amount of rockets that Hamas fires so that they can pretend that the Iron Dome is effective when in reality, the Iron Dome doesn't do shit and it's just a huge waste of money. Unironically, he believes this, yes. Just reading some quotes out of his book. Um, The armed resistance Hamas put up during the eight-day Israeli assault was largely nominal. The lopsidedness of the war was suggested by Defense Minister Barak as he boasted that Hamas only succeeded in hitting Israeli targets with a single ton of explosives, while targets in Gaza were hit with, thousand, with a thousand tons. On the other hand, although Israel celebrated its deployment of Iron Dome, the anti-missile defense system did not save countless Israeli lives, and perhaps did not save any lives. Compare civilian casualties before and after Israel's anti-missile defense system became operative. The bottom line was, Iron Dome effectively made no difference. It's unlikely that in the main... And allowing for any occasional aberration, Hamas used more sophisticated projectiles during Pillar of Defense. Though its army of informers and state-of-the-art aerial surveillance, Israel would have been privy to any... Also, he denies also that the missiles coming out of, or the rockets coming out of the Gaza Strip have become more sophisticated over time. He just completely denies that um, at all. Um, If Israel hailed Iron Dome, it was because it sought to salvage something redemptive from its otherwise failed operation. Shortly after, oh, and then, shortly after Pillar of Defense ended, MIT missile defense expert Theodore Postal voiced doubts. Quote, that's the guy that we just read about. Quote, initially, I drank the Kool-Aid on Iron Dome, end quote. He admitted, quote, I'm skeptical. I suspect it is not working as well as the Israelis are saying, end quote. A senior, rock and a senior Israeli rocket scientist subsequently rated the claims made for Iron Dome, quote, exaggerated, end quote, at best. I really think you should make a deliberate effort to discredit the experts on this issue. I don't, it's not worth it. I think going through and doing like a full takedown of this book would be interesting, but it would take me months to do it. But it's unbelievable how much he just like, it's just so shoddy. 
Oh, here's another uh, from 20 pages later. Israel misrepresented not only the threat posed by Hamas's terror tunnels, <laughs> that he puts in quotes, it also inflated the performance of its anti-missile defense system and the threat posed by Hamas's rockets, <laughs> in quotes. Hamas reportedly fired 5,000 rockets and 2,000 mortar shells at Israel during the operation. To reconcile the vast discrepancy between the many thousands of projectiles Hamas unleashed, on the other hand, and the minimal death and destruction they inflicted, on the other, Israel motioned to its wondrous Iron Dome anti-missile defense system. A leading Israeli military correspondent posited that were it not for the Iron Dome, quote, the Israel casualty count would have been uh, infinitely higher, end quote, while an Israeli diplomat purported that Iron Dome, quote, prevented thousands of potential Israeli civilian casualties, end quote. But this explanation does not persuade. Whereas Israel alleged that Iron Dome intercepted 740 rockets, the UN Department of Safety and Security put the number at closer to 240. I haven't read the underlying report for that. Who knows how misquoted that is. However, the most skeptical reckoning came from one of the world's leading authorities on anti-missile defense, Theodore Postal of MIT. Quote, or, or parentheses, Postal had previously debunked claims hyping the Patriot anti-missile defense system in the 1991 Gulf War. He concluded that Iron Dome successfully intercepted 5% of incoming Hamas rockets, or on the basis of Israel's raw data, an underwhelming 40, 40 of them. Even accepting for argument's sake the official Israeli tally of 740 successful interceptions, it's still perplexed why the thousands of Hamas projectiles that Iron Dome did not intercept caused so little damage. Why is it perplexing? They're literally rockets that can't be aimed, and Iron Dome only intercepts stuff that's headed for populated areas. It's only perplexing if you don't know what the Iron Dome does, if you don't know what Hamas does, and if you don't know anything about the conflict. How can he even make the sentence? The sentence literally makes no sense whatsoever. Um. Yeah, if Jesus. Why would Finkelstein lie about this? Because he's bought into a whole narrative of Israel, and he will buy any conspiracy theory that has to do with, like, uh, Israeli propaganda. Yeah. Sight check, faith, fateful triangle by Chomsky. Okay. How much did you get in international law during the debate? Barely, but it didn't matter because every time I bring up a point, he would just start ignoring me. He started to make the point that like, pl the plausible standard is very, very, very high. And I was like, no, the plausible standard is very f low. And he was like, oh, well, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to go with what the judges think instead of you, Wikipedia warrior motor mouth. And then I'm like, okay, well, then let's, then I'll quote you the, what the judge says. So then I start reading this quote and then Figlesine just talks over me the entire time because the judges themselves contend, of course, or admit, of course, that the court has not asked in the, in the present phase of the proceedings to determine whether South Africa's allegations of genocide are well-founded. At this stage, the court may only examine whether the circumstances of the present case, as they have been presented to the court, justify the ordering of provisional measures to protect rights under the genocide convention which are at risk of being violated before the decision on the merits it's render is rendered but i don't even know if you can hear me say this because he just talks over me the entire time anyway me what a horrible conversation my god do you think that the people who call israel a colonial state are clueless or just want to ignore the facts about the history of palestine and now there are even arabs in palestine i don't know benny and i i think fought over that a bit but they anytime you like counter a point Um, hold on. Anytime, I, anytime, anytime either of us would counterpoint, they would just move on to the next thing. They wouldn't address literally anything. Like, do you think Finkel holds his views genuinely or is he lying? I have no idea. I'm not sure. Why didn't Lex uh, stop Norm from interrupting you? Um, I think he was just kind of letting us run with it. And he did stop us at a few points, but yeah. Did they bring up the food convoys that got shot and trampled? Uh, no, I don't think either of them were, they didn't seem to be aware of the news because I feel like they would have brought that up. Are we really doing another month on Israel Palestine? No, we're just gonna chill this month. I'll still do debates, but I'm not gonna be like actively researching anything. I think I have enough info to counter the haters. <laughs> Were the Houthis brought up during the Congo? Yeah, I don't understand because Norm tried to do the thing, um, Norm tried to do the thing where he was like, I'm sorry, but I support international law, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, well, do you still support the Houthis? And he's like, I absolutely would support anybody trying to stop genocide. And I was like, well, okay, then you, then you pick and choose international law too. And then after I said that, you pick and choose when to follow international law. Do you know what he did? He did this, okay. I said, okay, well, it seems like you pick and choose when you want to follow international law as well. And he did this, he got, I wanted to kill myself. Oh my God. 
he hit me with the he hit me with the Smirkenstein, okay? <laughs> the unbeatable. The unbeatable. Oh my god. Hey, how's it going? Hi, what's up? Uh, I text it was cool to meet you in, uh, in person in Ohio. Yeah, duh, because I'm a cool person. Yeah. <laughs> what's up? Um, yeah, I had some um, some disagreements. Actually, it was cool. It was exactly kind of what you were going over, except I had some some better quote mind quotes I wanted to get your thoughts on. Just basing you into my stream. Um, okay, so I had I had a few things I wanted to go over. Um, polling data, human shields. Uh, I watched your conversation with Joe. Um, I was wondering if you if you looked at the article I sent you on uh, the IDF targeting that particular journalist. Uh, I might have, but I don't remember it. That overall. Yeah, and then um, yeah, I had a bunch of bunch of quotes that I mined. So. Uh, I don't know if one of those you want to start with. Um, I guess the I guess the polling polling data actually. So I was curious just which particular polls you were looking at in terms of if Palestinians want to fight, if they want one state versus two state. Because when I talked to you last time, you you quoted me some kind of old polls um, that weren't really. I don't think they were old yeah. at all. I think they were pretty recent. Um, it's from like two thousand eight. Oh, I don't know what those are from. There's a site that, uh, I don't remember what it was called. Forethought might have it. There's an abbreviation for this. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? It's, it's oh, PCPSR, that might be it. P, PCPSR. Palestinian public opinion polls. I think this is the largest Palestine public polling thing, I think. Um, here, I'll just throw you a random link and then you can search from here, I guess. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that's great. I, I just wanted to be kind of up to date in my head in terms of what you were looking at for that. Because I know you've talked a lot before about being... Um, that people should be pretty skeptical of how polls will translate into into action as well. So just being kind of careful around polls and being too concrete. For sure, yeah. Um, I know... So I was thinking about this when I was watching you talking to Ben Shapiro. Um that it seems like you, as a debater, have a preference for standing on whatever ground you feel like you can defend more firmly. And so if it's not 100% known exactly where Palestinians stand, but there's some polls that say, oh, maybe they want to fight, maybe they don't want a two-state, then that's a little bit more defensible rather than arguing for the position of, we actually don't really know, we don't have the proper polling to say with any certainty. What do you think about that? that situation is that is that a I fair? don't even know what the question is so do how do I I don't know or we don't know what Palestinians want because we only have some polling data to say as much or mm -hmm. yeah but you know if you're if you're in a debate or you're talking to Ben Shapiro you obviously don't want to look weak or like you don't really know you know what's going on but to argue for the position of doubt is a little tougher but I think in this case it's probably a good position to argue for rather than we know Palestinians you know, say this or say that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, polling data is just a snapshot of what a population thinks in response to a polling question at a particular point in time. It's mm -hmm. not determinative of what a population will support or what's politically or socially and militarily yeah. possible. But I mean, like, you can speak pretty confidently about the polling data. You just have to be careful, I guess, about the conclusions you draw from the polling data, but. Mm -hmm. Yes, so conclusions like, um, like Palestinians would have to go through a major shift before they'd be less radical or more willing to accept a two-state solution, something like that. I'm, I'm trying to think of general statements that I've heard you say. Yeah, I don't um, know as much if that's true anymore. Maybe that's not necessarily true, and instead they just need like a really important, brave leader that is willing to come out and make mm -hmm. some big deals, and maybe the population would shift significantly mm -hmm. if like a brave leader actually came out and figured something out, maybe? But Yeah. Uh, or, or if there was some, some really, really good-faith-looking plan out of Israel to create a Palestinian state, then maybe that would immediately have some kind of impact toward like a more more hopeful view. Maybe. I don't know what that state would have to look like at this point, but sure. Sure. Um, okay, so let me let me go to the, the quote mining then, I guess. So I, I was starting to look through, I was like, oh, we all have heard of like the Smotrich um, and the, 
what was that? the Ben Gavir kind of quotes that were kind of unhinged. Like, uh-huh. oh, you know, NACPA 2023, you know, maybe we should drop an atomic bomb on Gaza, this kind of crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. And I, I kept hearing this like, oh, you know, we should keep, we shouldn't freak out about these quotes because it's like, okay, there's some peop- some crazy people saying some crazy stuff. You know, if some American congressman were saying some crazy stuff, I'd be like, oh, okay, it's one congressman, whatever. And this doesn't characterize American position. But just to to name the people that I've seen now, it's like, Agriculture Minister, Finance Minister, uh, Minister of National Security, Tourism Minister, Minister of Construction and Housing, the head of the opposition party, and the Vice Prime Minister are all like kind of high high positions of authority that have also crazy stuff. Yeah, so here, this is the issue that, um, and this is just an optically losing debate because the genocide argument is literally the most soy-infused argument of all of mankind. Um, this is this is how it should go, and maybe the whole world will change because none of the stuff, nobody actually gives a fuck about any of the actual laws or rules or whatever anymore. This is how it should go, okay? Genocide requires the special intent, okay, to destroy a people um, in whole or in part uh, of like a particular ethnic group, a particular national group. Um, the genocidal intent can't just be a, a, a war or military intent, even if mm-hmm. the war or military intent is incredibly extreme. And the problem is that in this particular case, people are incapable of separating those two things out. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible that there are people that have made quotes, even high up in power, that seem genocidal in nature. But mm-hmm. the problem is that like somebody will take a quote of like a, 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 an Israeli high up person saying, like, we need a new Gaza, fuck these people. And you know, people are like, oh, well, that's genocide. And it's like, I don't think that's genocide. Even if you were to kill every single mm-hmm. Palestinian person, I don't think that that would necessarily be genocide because you're looking for the special sure. intent yep. of genocide. Just like when we nuked Japan, that wasn't genocide. Just like when we bombed Dresden, that wasn't genocide. Just like when tens of millions of uh, Soviets or whatever were being killed by Germans and German Soviets when they were marching, that wasn't genocide. Um, none of these things, the Civil War in the United States was not genocide. None of these things were genocide. Uh, even though it involves war and a, and a mass amount of civilian loss of life and people who are trying to kill or defeat like other countries, the question is always like, you know, is is the goal of, of one particular country to actually destroy a whole people? Is, is that the mm-hmm. goal? And the fact that this the military operation that's happening right now is starting in response to an attack already severely undercuts that uh, that that claim severely undercuts it's because now the problem is what's happening is every single quote that's being given the question is well okay well is this like a quote that's expressing an intent for genocide or is this a quote where it's like we really want to destroy this country like we want to destroy these people they attacked us blah 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 like is it actually genocidal or is it like is is this war Um, because Mm -hmm. i think that if you look at the statements on both sides by ukrainians and russians you could very easily say oh this is genocidal oh this but it's not genocidal it's two countries at war with each other yeah can i um i I didn't, I didn't want to get into too much details because I, I mostly agree with what you're saying, but can you can you think of a quote from some like high Ukrainian official that was on the level of like maybe we should wipe out all the people from Russia, something like that? Um, I bet that if I dig through quotes, I bet I can find statements that have been made by people high up in Ukrainian military leadership that either refer to people as orcs or laugh at like Russian soldiers getting killed or that make comments about how they want to be able to bomb. And so I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive. I, find mm-hmm. I can't think of any in particular off the top of my head, but I'm sure I can go and find like there's like whole subreddits where people are, like making fun of Ukrainian people are making fun of Russians dying. Didn't they OK it on Facebook to make like statements of hate towards Russians or something? Or did they ban that or something as Ukrainians were writing statements on sure. that? I mean, that's Russia? a um that's like a russophobic thing from a western audience i'm just i'm just trying to think if there's something i could latch on to that's a direct analogy where it's like you know we're rolling out gaza we're rolling out a new gaza um, ben Gurion should have finished the job no such thing as a palestinian people um you know these these something on those level it's like r- real russians don't exist like you know we're gonna we're gonna wipe them all out something like that i, I don't know if something on that level from ukrainian officials yeah, I'm not sure. I could go back and look, but I'm I'm just super not mm-hmm. interested. But I'm I'm sure it has um, been said because I feel like I recall um, people are quote, posting quotes of like uh, Americans during World War II that. Um, mm-hmm. I can uh, imagine there's definitely some American politicians. Uh, fuck, what was it? Said, you know, there'll be no Germany standing once we're done. No, 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 no. It was. Fuck. Where did this quote go? This is a. F- Why are chat so fucking hard to scroll and laggy? My God.
Is that the YouTube or DGG chat? When we're done with them, the Japanese language will only be spoken in hell. By uh, said by a senior yeah. American military official after Pearl Harbor, and then we nuked them twice. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, 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 yeah. That would be something analogous. So I, I think I think I agree with you. I, I I wouldn't take these quotes as affirmatively saying, you know, the the Israeli uh, government or the IDF is actively trying to do a genocide. I think that's like way too far based on the evidence available. Um, and that's on like a kind of far side of trying to make a claim. I think the much kind of closer claims to make is it's like, okay, not genocide, because that's like, we're gonna go and wipe these people out wherever they are. It's more on the side of um, ethnic cleansing, but even that's a little bit further than I think the, the nearest claim, which is basically pushing the people of Gaza out of Gaza. Maybe it's not because you know, we hate Gazans or whatever, but just we don't want them there, you know, or we want that land or whatever. Okay, but like, and then, and maybe... then, and then, we're, and then just there's an even nearer claim than that, which is not that affirmatively Israel is trying to do this, but it's these statements are at a concerning level for a country that is planning to occupy this area and says that it's going to administrate it for some amount of time and then give it back. So okay. that's, I think, the nearest claim. So here's the question. Can we find in Israel's operations or statements something inconsistent with a country got attacked by another group? That country wants to go in and destroy or eliminate that group and destroy or eliminate that group's ability to attack that country again. Can we find something inconsistent with that? Because I think all of Israel's actions can be very clearly and obviously explained by this. Sure. I mean, if we're, if we're going to gloss over the the things that could point to war crimes which could kind of chain up to pointing to okay there's a level of disregard that implies that they're they're Not interested necessarily. In, in killing a lot of civilians war crimes don't get um, us any closer to genocide as well maybe in like well, a very very because uh, like you can commit tons of war crimes in a, in a military conflict with no desire to do genocide if, if whatsoever they're, if they're committing the types of war crimes that will lead to a lot of civilian deaths and destruction of homes that will force people to leave. I think those are the kind of things that could point toward, I'm not saying get you all the way there, but would be evidence toward saying we want maybe not even genocide, but ethnic cleansing, getting people out of the homes. Sure. So ethnic cleansing, I don't even like the term ethnic cleansing. I think it's a sure, stupid that's fine. term. I, I, it, I, but like, a lot more, in, sure, a lot I'm just more saying overall like mindset, but, but literally just getting people out of their homes, right? So there's, I'm just going through every member of the Knesset and trying to see, have they positively stated that they want to resettle like North Gaza, basically. Mm -hmm. And I've already found four of the 120 Knesset members that have specifically said, now, obviously that doesn't directly translate into plans for the government, but um, my my understanding is that members of the Knesset basically, you know, are, are able to form policy. That's like, if, if it turned out that a third of the Knesset had specifically said, said that, even though there wasn't yet a plan, would, would that be concerning? Uh, I think it'd be concerning, but not because it's genocide. Can't we be concerned about things that aren't like the no, top no, no, most I, insane I'm, I'm crimes in the world? I'm literally not talking about genocide. I'm literally not talking about genocide. Oh, I mean, I think it would be, I think I'm settlements are already Northern bad, Gaza. and I think settle, settlements are already bad, so settling anything more would be bad, including mm -hmm. Gaza, yes. Sure. Uh, I mean, where's where's the line? So there's the line of like, okay. Here's, hold on, wait, 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 stop. Okay, okay, hold on. This is my issue. I hate this so much, okay? Sure. There is no line, okay? It's not, this is peace, this is terrorism, this is war, and this is genocide. People want to put this on a spectrum, and when you've done that, you've already assassinated your brain's ability to comprehend well, wait, no, anything. I, I had a specific type of line that I was Sure, thinking. okay, well, let, let's, okay, but what I don't like is that it feels like you've got military conflict, and it's real bad, it's genocide. Mm -hmm. Genocide is a wholly separate thing. Israel could go in and kill 5,000 Palestinians in a way that would constitute the crime of genocide. Israel could go yep. in and kill 1,000 Palestinians in a way that would constitute the crime of genocide. Genocide is a wholly separate thing from war crimes, civilian deaths, war, terrorism, from all these other things, okay? So mm -hmm. in terms of like, like, what would the line be? I don't know. The issue is that it's incredibly difficult to imagine right now because Israel has so many valid concerns and valid reasons to want to go in and fight that I don't even know why they would be genocidal. They don't need to even be genocidal to sure, want agreed. to kill or destroy a, a, a whole bunch of Hamas members or a whole bunch of parts of, of the Gaza Strip. So I think it's the, the thing that makes it really hard is it feels like every single major operation that happens 
cast lead, protective edge, um, or uh, operation pillar of defense, or the swords of iron. All of these seem to come after hundreds or thousands of rocket attacks by Hamas into Israel. That is hard to imagine why I need to inject any kind of genocidal intent here when we have so many appropriate causes for war. I, I just don't know where it would even come from. The same that I wouldn't imagine that America wants to go genocide Japan, they bomb Pearl Harbor. We've got a, a super legitimate cause for war here. Um, I don't even know if I would necessarily say it gets more tricky, but I don't even know what I would necessarily say now, for instance, like the Arab states wanted to genocide all the Jews when they were fighting all the wars in 48 and 56 and 73 and 76. I don't even know if these were necessarily genocidal wars, you know? They might've just been trying to destroy Israel because they don't want the country there because they don't like all the immigrants that are coming in. Um, yeah, I'm not saying it's impossible for genocide to happen. I just I don't understand the hyper fixation. It's such an irrelevant right, so, point at the end of the day because there's not much strong still, evidence pointing towards it, and there's so many other more important things to talk about. Yeah, so I'm still not talking about genocide. That's sure. still not my my focus at all. So when I say line, what I was going to finish was line. At which point, um, for example, the U.S. has to seriously evaluate what kind of strings we're attaching to military aid. Right. So something like okay, you have to severely rein in when your governmental officials are saying things that people will latch onto is this kind of intent where they're saying we need a we need to settle northern gaza you guys can't be saying that at all right if 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 you guys are going to be taking over this area and saying you're going to give it back and not settling it then you can't have people in your government saying that something like that that kind of line so, so my question is, where is that line where the U.S. is going to say, like, guys, you've got to actually get your shit in order? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, if they were to start building settlements or it seemed like there was actually huge support. For, I mean, they have a right to express that opinion. Like, it's well, their they're, it's their members. Are we going to sit here and say, like, you don't have the right to say that, you know, you should bring settlements back? To, I don't know. That's kind of a weird thing to tell. If they would actually start building settlements in fucking Gaza, I think that's cause for a severe restriction of aid. Or if it looks like they're actually mobilizing to do that, I think it'd be really bad. But I mean, the members of their Knesset are allowed to express their opinion. I mean, well, they're they're allowed they're allowed to express that. But I think if members of a, of a government, um, if some fraction of members of a government are saying we should do exactly this, you can't you can't call people who are saying, "Ooh, maybe Israel is going to do this." You can't call those people crazy. I right? absolutely can. Just like how Marjorie Taylor Greene doesn't dictate U.S. foreign policy, one or two members of the far right parties in the Knesset also don't dictate what's happening with the actual war effort. If they did, I think things would look a lot different. Sure, but she's she's okay. If if she says that, and Trump is president, and it's like you know, 60, 40 in Congress and the Senate and a decent number of both of those um, of both the, the House and the Senate were saying this, then it's 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 genuinely moving in that direction. Yeah, I think that would be right? troubling. And you would say as much. You'd say like, hey, this is troubling. I hope you guys don't do that. And then if they do start to do it, then you probably start conditioning aid or something. Sure. OK, so OK, so so it sounds like for you, your line would be on some some actual action of they've started building settlements it wouldn't be or like or, at least a movement in that direction man, like, it wouldn't just be like four or five members of their congress of their parliamentary body saying things after like mm -hmm. a huge terrorist attack their country yeah i don't mm -hmm. think it would be that okay um all right i'll just move on to the, the last thing i wanted to talk to you about which is this question over human shields so i was i was interested in your um your conversation with joe over this which it seems like you maintain the position that Israel, um, by international law, needs to treat human shields as, as civilians. They're still civilians. They still have to be factored into any calculations around uh, proportionality versus a military advantage. Um, but at the same at the same time, it feels like there's like a sneaky principle that's making its way in where you say it's it's because of Hamas or Hamas is the one who's morally culpable for putting these civilians in this situation. And it seems like some of the moral culpability is being taken off of the IDF for bombing those civilians in that situation of being human shields. Correct. All of the moral okay. culpability would be taken off the IDF and all of the moral culpability would be assigned to Hamas, is what I would say. So is that in the situation that, um, 
that the IDF is still properly doing those calculations, treating those human shields as civilians, or would that still be true even if they weren't doing those calculations? If they weren't doing the calculations, then I would say that Israel starts to suffer and, and has responsibility or culpability. Okay. Okay, I think that's fair. Um, Basically, you have, um, you have an obligation to shield your civilian population from attack. You have an obligation to try to protect your civilian population in times of war to make sure that they're not being destroyed by the enemy. Um, if you're failing to do that, if you fail to protect your civilian population, that, that is a violation of international law. You are, you are failing mm -hmm. to uphold um, your, I think this is under additional protocol, uh, it's either additional protocol one or two. Actually, I think it might be both. <clears throat> Uh, it's Article 58 of Additional Protocol 1. Uh, the parties to the conflict shall, to the maximum extent feasible, without prejudice to Article 49 of the Fourth Convention, endeavor to remove the civilian population, individual civilians, and civilian objects under their control from the vicinity of military objectives, avoid locating military objectives within or near densely populated areas, and take the other necessary precautions to protect the civilian population, individual civilians, and civilian objects under their control against the dangers resulting from military operations. Um, this is in Additional Protocol 1, I'm pretty sure, and Additional Protocol 2, under Article 13, there's also protection of the civilian population, um, saying that they shall enjoy protections against um, the dangers of rescue military operations. Um, they shall not be the object of attack. They shall enjoy the protections afforded by this part. Um, I think it's for belligerents, actually. So um, the, the, the Article 58 under Additional Protocol 1 basically means that you have to protect your civilian population. Hamas fails to do that. Um, mm -hmm. On Israel's side, now when they go to attack, they still have to obey things of distinction. So for instance, you can't just start killing civilians at large because of whatever, but if you identify a military target and it's commingled with civilians and Hamas is utilizing that to try to, you know, afford them some protection, which would be human shielding, um, you have an obligation to do a proportionality assessment to make yeah. sure that the amount of civilians killed is, you know, worth the concrete military advantage that's enjoyed by targeting whatever uh, thing, and then you go from there. But in that case, like, Israel is conducting itself according to the rules of war, even if they are killing civilians in a way that is 100% wholly consistent with international law, and Hamas is the one that's failing to conduct themselves in a way that's wholly consistent with international law. So I would say, even in the case where 100 civilians are killed to kill 50 Hamas operatives, Israel has no moral culpability for the deaths of those civilians, and Hamas has 100% the moral culpability if, if they're utilizing them to, to gain a, a military advantage by shielding their military objectives. Mm -hmm. and, and the proportionality is respected. Do you think that Israel should be compelled to substantiate some or, or any of those claims around military targets? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if anybody is ever expected to do those things, ever. Unless they're like formally charged with a crime internationally, I don't know if that has mm -hmm. ever been the case. Where you have to make like those things are by by nature. Those things are a lot of those are secret. Like you don't. There's a yeah. oh fuck. There's actually a name for this particular type of thing. I think it's a three letter abbreviation that stands for the actual cost of a military objective for a civilian life. But these numbers mm -hmm. are secret, and militaries don't publish these for obvious reasons. You don't want people to know mm -hmm. exactly what a how much they would need to shield a particular object. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, like well, I guess, should, so yeah. so either publish or provide to like the U.S. military, U.S. intelligence for them to make... Well, U.S. Um, military, U.S. intelligence doesn't matter. Nobody cares about that because Israel already has done that at times. And people just say the, mil the U.S. will just suck up to Israel and not mm -hmm. actually hold them to account, so... I mean, I, I am concerned with... Um, um, I'm sure I'm sure you've talked about this. The It's called the Gospel, Israel's, like, new AI targeting tool. Um, yeah, I've heard that. It sounds a little cringe. I don't know if they're actively utilizing that in the field or not yet. But So, yeah, so um, I think they talked about, I, I can try to pull the link for you, but it was, it was something like they managed to uh, like double or triple their generation of targets using this. And um, um, it's concerning that um, now it's not even on on analysts to come up with a reason for a target. They they still need manual approval, so it's not like there's just, you know, Skynet drones going out and just killing people totally like AI controlled. But the the AI is not necessarily something you can kind of backtrack and even say why exactly was this determination made. It's still manually like reviewed. But the speed at which they're increasing their number of targets, um, I think is concerning about how, you know, if if those calculations even could be done in a situation like this. 
I mean, it could be good, it could be bad. I don't think you should write it off just because it's AI. Like, it could be incredibly good. Maybe generating 100 targets is better when uh, human intelligence could only generate 10 targets and all of those had huge cost of life for civilians attached to it. Maybe the additional AI-generated targets don't have the same civilian cost of life. I have no idea that I'd have to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you think there should be... I mean... I'd be, I'd be curious to know if, if anything has ever been released in terms of those conversations ever being had or any kind of um, kind of best practices within the IDF of like what number of of civilians, you know, for a strike that I don't think I don't know if any military like has ever released those numbers. I don't know if that stuff would ever just be released publicly because it's such a sensitive yeah. thing. And I mean, if it if it turned out that literally there you know, their numbers were, I don't know, 30 to 1 or 50 to 1 or 100 to 1 or, or whatever would be past the line of what's kind of Well, the of thing accepted. is, it's not just going to be, it's not just going to be number of civilians per Hamas militant. It might be how important that Hamas militant is. It might be of what course, is the of risk course. of to your military. It might, like, there might mm -hmm. be a whole bunch of other things, yeah. But if, if that, if that were, if that were released and it turned out that it were, I mean, I'm actually curious, is there some specific some specific standard i know the general concept behind the proportionality i have no is, idea is, is I, maybe some, in some, some leaked, formula someone's saying that in the iraq afghanistan leaks some of that information was available but i don't know mm -hmm. i mean if it if it turns out that what the the kind of worldwide accepted practice is something like you know 100 civilians to one low level hamas or if not some officer or leader or whatever um <laughs> would that be something that I don't know, us among the, the left or whatever of the international community should, should demand some some kind of further action on because because if it's the case that it's it's such a lax you know, lax number, then I I think that's not a, a sufficient protection for civilians. Possibly. But remember, okay, this has to be considered at all points in time, okay? International humanitarian law and specifically the law of armed conflict, okay, is balanced on a razor edge for protecting two different things. It has to be the protection, the general protections of civilians, and it has to be for the ability for nations to conduct war. If you, mm -hmm. if you lose either of those things, all of it becomes pointless. Because if nations discover, oh, you know, my proportionality has to always be like one to one, and oh, my opponents just discovered that if they shoot rockets at me from buildings, I can never attack them. Well, this is stupid. I'm never following international law again. This is a whole worthless apparatus, and I'm just gonna march and do what the mm -hmm. fuck I want because I'm gonna get fucked anyway, so who the fuck cares? That's the worst case scenario. People always think that the worst case scenario of international law is that, oh no, they're being too lenient on allowing more civilian deaths, but there's another worst case scenario of being too strict on it, where you make it so that basically you're you're telling states you guys can never basically conduct warfare against guerrilla operatives. You can never conduct warfare against people that utilize civilian populations as shields, and now you've emboldened those groups, and now you've made other nations just not give a fuck about international law. It's like, oh, well, fuck it. We're going to violate it anyway, so. Yeah, so that, so that was kind of my follow-up of um, if it's the case that in this situation, so let's say just um, whether whether or not Hamas was particularly trying to put civilians in harm's way, but just the the number of civilians living in some some small area made it so that in order for um, for Israel to carry out their objective of destroying Hamas, that they would necessarily have to go beyond the the kind of current conception international standard that for them that standard should be loosened so that they have the capacity to conduct war is that something that you personally no i don't think the standard should be loosened okay that maybe the standards maybe they need to be changed but they shouldn't be applied selectively in different situations okay. no okay yeah that's good i agree with that um okay i think those are my my main points i wanted to hit um Okay. Yeah. Did you have any questions for me about about any of those or anything that you wanted to put more push back on anything I said? Nope. But I love you. All right. <laughs> Take care, buddy. Be careful. Bye.